Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel and this is the Hour of the Raven, your channel for everything Ravenloft, RPG, Dungeons and Dragons and Horror. Today we will explore the secrets of Demon Dew, where the intrigue and violence of a land on the brink of revolution mask a secret war between sinister manipulative forces. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this video will focus on Demon Dew of the classic Ravenloft setting and we will consider the events and characters that existed in the domain prior to the Von Richten Guide to Ravenloft reboot. At the end of my video coverage of Demon Liu from the classic Ravenloft setting, I will make some considerations and comparisons with the new version of Demon Liu in the Von Richten Guide to Ravenloft. Some maps I will be using in this video were created by Richard de Raville, or has been leading a project to create beautiful maps for Ravenloft's domains and cities. You can check out the amazing work he's been doing in the Ravenloft Cartographic Society community on Facebook, the link of which I will leave below in the video description. Are you ready? In our search for the missing Dr. Rudolf van Richten and for the cure of lycanthropy, we arrive at Port Alucine, the capital of Demon Liu seeking the support of the famous detective Alanik Ray. Upon arriving in Port Alucine, we discover that Alanik is also missing after launching an investigation into a possible evil influence manipulating the Melieu society. Retracing tracing his last steps, we discover that he visited the Grand Opera Nationale and after a conversation with the chief consular Dominic Donner, in his private box, he immediately abandoned the performance and took a carriage to the dock area. Following in his wake, we reach the dangerous harbor region and search for information on his whereabouts. At a tavern of dubious reputation, we found some informants waiting to speak for the right amount of coins. A ragged looking man tells us that the renowned detective had rented an attic of a warehouse where he had established his base of investigations. As we walk through the alleys in the search of this address, we have the clear sensation of being followed and observed. At the door, no one answers our call, and we decide to break in. Inside the attic, we found that the place is abandoned and Alanik Ray's notes and documents are scattered around the room. In search of answers, we delve into the notes and investigations of the secrets of Demon Liu. How Exploring the secrets of Demon Liu is like getting lost in a maze full of hidden traps. This sophisticated society hides intrigue, mysteries and horrors, which like a beautiful carnivorous plant, lure its prey to a deadly fate. While for many, the very soul and cultural identity of Demon Liu is inseparable from this remarkable capital, Port Alucine. Other towns and villages in this land also hide a range of sinister secrets. In the city of Edrigan, an aristocratic family has been tormented by many generations by an evil and possessive force. The leaders of the Madrigor family suffer the possession by an evil entity known as Drigo, a Gerlet Shator, a fiend who was engulfed in the mists from the lower plain of Carceri. The unholy phylactery that guard his soul was a quill pen adorned with gemstones and marble that is passed down from the elders to the younger generation of the family, allowing the fiend to always possess the head of the family. Under its control, generations of this family devoted themselves to writing the Madrigorian a series of philosophical and occult treatises dealing with profane law, known for the vast dealing of the lower planes and demonology and its ability to corrupt the readers. 
In the past, Dr. Van Richten and a group of allies decided to destroy this evil entity, but the result was catastrophic. Although they managed to lure the creature into a mystical cage, a serious mistake was made when trying to bind the monster, and Rigor murdered almost all of the party. Dr. Van Richten speculates that he survived this encounter only because of the curse that damns him to live, to see the death and suffering of his companions. To this day, Drigo whereabout is unknown in the land of the mists. The city of Shatufo, in the southern area of the domain, has also fallen victim to the influence of infernal forces in the past. This city played an important role in the defense of the kingdom, and it carries this military history and legacy on its main avenue, Boulevard Jardin, named in honor of the general who led the defense of Dimonlu against Falkovnian forces. Although it does not share the grandeur and sophistication of the capital Port Alicin, the city of Chateaufo has over the years attracted a large number of artisan workshops, inventors and scientists. Far from the hype of the capital and the volatile interference of the politics and aristocracy, some renowned artisans settled in the city, which became an industrial hub. The most famous of its industries is perhaps Clerc and Vebois, a factory of sophisticated and luxurious carriages. Inventors and scientists also bring renown to the city, which claims to be the birthplace of inventions like the miniature pocket watches that are the latest fashion in Port Alucine, as well as the mobile mechanical presses capable of mass printing of books. Such advances did not come without cost, however. An explosion in a laboratory obliterated three houses a few years ago, and another inventor's house was boarded up for the last ten years when his printing press machine became haunted running on its own to print disturbing messages, with no one operating it. However, the most sinister events that affected the region occurred after the Grand Conjunction. During this period of turmoil, a temporary portal was opened between the Demiplane of Dread and the Lower Plains of Bator, and two Batezus, and a host of hellworms, were imprisoned in Chateaufo. The devils known as Amnizu and Babazu soon discover that they became permanent prisoners of the mists and decided to make the city of Chateaufo their new home. They murdered the mayor and captain of the guard, assuming their mortal forms and identities, and started a government of terror. Their first step to hide the influence of their reality wrinkle was to poison the city waters with a hallucinogenic substance taken from the glands of a lesser batezu, which would keep the entire city susceptible to illusions. Under their command, strict and punitive laws were enacted, and by co-opting the most corrupt and violent members of the gendarmerie, the Black Watch was formed, a group of obedient militiamen to enforce their harsh laws. A climate of paranoia and fear was installed, and residents were encouraged to denounce their neighbors, who violated the strict laws imposed, to be flogged in the public square, or to suffer even worse fates. The rule of terror of this fiend was overthrown by the intervention of Dr. Rudolf von Richten and a group of allies, who discovered the diabolical rules and confronted them. At the moment of their final destruction, however, the creatures managed to escape and continue to roam the land of the mists. The effects of the passage of these infernal masters can still be felt today by the population of Chateaufou, 
as the contact with the hallucinogenic substance of Bato causing an outbreak of madness in the population. To this day, the number of insane people in this city is much higher than expected, and perhaps its waters are still contaminated somehow. Shortly after the removal of the fiends, the city's epitome of insanity attracted the attention of the renowned Dr. Wilhelm Mickey, who opened a sanitarium to study and try to cure the madness that befalls Chateaufort. To date, no real progress has been made in his research, and rumors claim that since his arrival, cases of insanity have only increased. The outskirts of Chateaufort hide the base of a secret society in the decrepit halls of an abandoned mansion. The Noble Brotherhood of Assassins was formed over a century ago by members of the Demolier Society who had grown tired of the hypocrisy and social disparity. Originally known as the Unseen Hand, they move against the aristocracy in their own games of intrigue, and under the leadership of the Mad Malkin, they had bold plans to act against the abuses of nobility. Over time, the secret society morphed into the Noble Brotherhood of Assassins, but despite its name, this group does not use violence. On the contrary, using rumors, intrigue and secrets, they work to assassinate reputations and fortunes. Through their actions, they seek to ruin the reputation of members of the aristocracy who abuse their position, and to disrupt criminal schemes to accumulate fortunes. Many of their victims are left with the bitter taste of having been victims of a cruel prank called by unknown authors. Continuing north, we approach the great capital Port Alucine and find in its surrounding the great University of Dimonlieu, perhaps the most renowned and expensive educational center in all of the Land of the Mists. With faculties of arcane sciences, history, military studies, divinities, medicine, physical science and more, it attracts aristocrat students from different realms in search of its excellence in teaching. The university is led by the firm hand of the Dean Lord Balfour de Castel. The renowned professor of the arcane arts is secretly one of the Umbra, the five leaders of the Fraternity of Shadows, a secret society dedicated to unlocking the secrets of the mists and the dark powers to gain power and control over the world around them. He takes advantage of his prestigious position and public figure as Dean to get close to monster hunters and adventurers, to uncover information and manipulate enemies who may in the future pose a threat to the fraternity. Even before arriving in Port Alucine, in the Sable Bay, we find the estates and mansions of the elite of Dimontieu, in the Domaine de la Vie Eclair, or the estates of the enlightened life. In this controlled access place, we find opulent palaces, full of paintings and frescoes, and explendorous gardens, where the most powerful and wealthy of all Dimontieu reside, among them the Lord Governor and the members of the Council of Brilliance. The most opulent of all the mansions, without a doubt, is the Donner family manor, which has a large foyer for balls and a beautiful hedge maze in its garden. Finally, close to the coast, around the Bay of Pernod, we reach the grand capital of Dimolieu, the beautiful and sophisticated Port Alucine. Its ancient buildings and ornate architecture house one of the most modern and influential cities in the Land of the Mists. It is divided into several quartiers around the main hill where the saint mer de lames Cathedral is located. Not even this sacred site is spared from strange mysteries. In the ruined cathedral, 
is an ancient stained glass window featuring an image that many consider to be a representation of the deity known as Ezra. This icon is known for its healing powers and there are many reports of people who, after praying at his feet, are healed of their injuries and illnesses. The truth is that this sacred artifact can also doom unworthy supplicants and many have been those cursed by the stained glass. The icon of Ezra can heal the ills of those who demonstrate true faith and devotion and prove themselves worthy. The stained glass drains and stores the cured diseases and ailments in its colored glass, but it can also pour out such conditions on the unworthy who dare to plead for divine help. The most striking of all the districts that make up the city of Port Alicine is without doubt the Quartier Public, where the majestic and grandiose government buildings and the most exquisite centers of art are located. The beautiful Place de Lyon is in front of the ruling palace and is surrounded by important centers of culture such as the Musée de Port Alicine, Théâtre de la Baie, and the Grand Bibliothèque. The most grandiose and striking of all these buildings is the Grand Opera Nationale, a splendid and luxurious construction adorned with columns, frescoes, statues, and large staircases that lead to a splendid theater adorned with gigantic crystal chandeliers. The building is surrounded by fear and superstition and many say that the place was cursed by Avistani and that all artists who perform there will die tragically. Others believe the opera is haunted by a vengeful ghost. These rumors only worsened after a tragic accident five years ago when one of the crystal chandeliers fell into the audience. Although many fear the supernatural, the fall of the chandelier was the subject of a complex plot of sabotage and murder. Aiming to ascend to the position of lead diva of the Grand Opera, the beautiful elf and talented singer Angel Polano plotted to spread rumors of a supernatural presence in the theater and made attempts on the life of Maria Diosa, the main star and doctor of the opera's owner. Angel Polano hid her truly monstrous nature. She was a werefox and for years lived in poor Alicine, seducing male victims and feeding on those who became uninteresting companions. In her quest for fame, she used her bewitched admirers in her murderous plot until she was confronted by adventures in the opera's underground tunnels. Another building that is shrouded in a tragic and macabre past is the Maison de Sur, or the House of Wax. This museum was a local tourist attraction, featuring numerous waxworks and life-size recreations of remarkable figures and events. Its creator and founder, Alexander de Sur, was a renowned sculptor and his wax statues attracted visitors from different parts of the mists. His house of wax brought him fame and fortune, but he felt his work were imperfect and incomplete. One night, frustrated, he called upon supernatural forces to grant him his wish, and as he walked to exhaustion, he cut his finger. Blood mixed with the wax, used in his obsessive work a sculpture of himself. To his horror, his sculpture opened his eyes and came to life, and the perfect statue of wax and blood drained the life from him with its touch, leaving the real Alexander in a comatose state, imprisoned in the basement of the house of wax. The golem took the place of its creator and decided to create more of his kind. He sculptured replicas of blood and wax of many individuals 
and had these statues take the place of their victims. This invasion of wax monsters was prevented by the action of adventurers, who finally managed to free the comatose victims from the basement of the House of Wax and put an end to this horror. Next to the Quartier Public is the Quartier Savant, or the Noble District, where you can find a considerable number of luxury residences, with lush terraces and gardens, and also elite and luxurious restaurants and shops. Here, most of the intrigues and plots of the aristocracy are fought, in a constant political game, which involve manipulation, blackmail and bribes, that reach up to the Lord Governor and the Council of Brilliance. It is surprising that, with so much intrigue and unrest, the government of Demont Dieu has experienced such a long period of stability, but this tranquility is due to the absolute control maintained by the chief councillor, Dominique Donner, over his peers. The discreet chief councillor avoids appearing in the spotlight, but it's a powerful mind influencer, capable of dominating and enslaving the will of those around him. Those who succumb to his mental domination sometimes end up becoming slaves to his will, becoming the obedient. Only the overlay of another mental domination can free an obedient from his servitude, and, like a spider in his web, Dominique Donaire maintains a network of slaves and spies to serve his will. Lord Governor Marcel Guignol is one of these obedients, and is already a frail old man, being held in power as a mere puppet for Dominique. The Council of Brilliance is also closely controlled by Dominique, who has made most of its members his obedience. Jean-Pierre Theroux is the Councillor for the Arts, and his opinion on a work can define its future, making it popular among the aristocracy, or determining its censorship. Through his control over the arts, he directs trends in influential the Molieu's culture, and suppresses any manifestations against the government. He is an obedient slave to Dominic's will, and his personality and flamboyant traits hide a tormented man who goes through bouts of self-mutilation. Claude Lagrange, the councillor of commerce and industry, is one of the most influential aristocrats, responsible for intermediating conversations with guilds and merchants. Originally a magician and illusionist, known for his knife-throwing skills, he joined the Société Le Jeu de Mar, an association of magicians and stage illusionists, who secretly come together to study arcane arts and occult secrets. Currently, he has become one of the ancients, the leaders of this secret group, and his quest for occult knowledge has corrupted his essence, and the dark powers gave him the morbid ability to turn his neck all the way back. His leadership of this secret cabal and knowledge of the arcane arts caught the attention of Dominic, who enslaved him as an obedient and elevated him to the Council of Brilliance. Josephine Chantreau, the Councillor for Defense and Order, is the commander of the Gendarmerie and a diplomatic leader. She was one of the creators of the Treaty of the Four Towers and a strong supporter of the Falkovnian trade embargo to deny them access to firearms and cannons. Although she is also an obedient under Dominic's command, she is driven by a strong desire for revenge against Vlad Drakov. As a young girl, she saw her father murdered during the first Falkovnian invasion, and her face was scared from a beating which is why she always covers her face with heavy makeup. Her hatred drives her to attempt a crusade against Falkovnia, and she is trying to co-opt high-ramping defectors from the Falkovnian armies. One of these deserters currently provides her with strategic information 
and has been promoted to the rank of official executioner, covering the mark of the hawk with a black hooded mask. She has also been trying to build connections and provide resources and support to the rebel group of the free men of Falkovnia, but to no avail yet. Finally, Hélène de Suy is the most recent councillor of the group and occupies the Council of Social Welfare. Her attributions are broad and involve the administration of meager subsidies offered to the poor population which gives her great access and influence on other social classes. The beautiful and slender councillor has not been turned into an obedient by Dominic, who seems to have a romantic interest in her. Dominic also wants to take advantage of her independence, to task her with investigating the mysterious presence that seems to rival his powers the figure known as The Brain, who runs criminal activities in the city. The manipulative Helen, however, may be playing a double game, hiding information and waiting to see who the winner of this match will be. In stark contrast to the luxury of the Quartier Savant, the Quartier Ouvrier, or the Worker District, reveals the Montreux social and economic disparity. Their wooden constructions are precarious and unstable, and they house many residents. In recent years, legends about a strange haunting have been gaining ground among commoners' tales. The ghost of a boy is acting as a guardian angel and is haunting violent people who threaten to harm children. The ghost appeared to be a 13-year-old child, severely beaten and injured, and is the spirit of Nikolai Melenta, a boy beaten to death by his father, who swore to return to punish him if he hurt his sister. The ghost kept his promise, and returned to stop his father's aggression, murdering him before he hurt his sister. Upon identifying a child abuser, Nikolai's ghost appear once to torment the abuser and warn them to abandon their conduct. Those who do not reform soon meet death at the hand of the ghost, who uses his telekinesis power to murder the abusers. The legend of the guardian ghost gained fame after the terrible case of the Delacour family. The aristocrat Marcel Delacour maintained a factory in which he hired children labor, but decided to increase his profits using his knowledge of necromancy. He murdered some children and raised them as an enhanced type of zombie, which would not decompose quickly and would be more capable and obedient. The action of Nikolai's ghost attracted the attention of a group of adventurers and Marcel de la Cour's plan were stopped. It is also amongst the poorest population that an insurgency begins to form. Injustice and social disparity have fueled the population's revolt and fury, and some have begun to organize themselves into political groups. One of these groups, called Le Ordures, or the Refuse, have banded together to make non-violent attacks on the aristocracy. The destruction of works of art and exhibitions, poisoning wine with sedatives and other acts aimed at embarrassing and humiliating the elite have already been performed, but some members of this group are prone to adopt more violent measures for their revolt and revolution. Finally, the Quartier Marchand, or the Merchants District, is the busiest part of the city. In the region are most of the aristocracy's workshop and industries, where workers earn their livelihood, and is home to the busy and dangerous port area. During the day, goods are constantly loaded and unloaded from the port, and sailors and ruffians fill the docks and taverns. During the night, the streets are deserted, except for a few drunks and bandits, that make the region quite violent. The region is plagued by horrors from the depths of the ocean, 
In summer, it's common for a sea spawn to approach the bay, eager to feed on human flesh. These sea monsters expel minions and send them to the surface, tiny slugs that seek prey for their master. They bite at the base of the neck and paralyze their victims, while they penetrate their brains and dominate them, controlling their minds and memories. These victims began to serve the sea spawn master, bringing victims to satisfy his hunger. For this sinister reason, the streets that borders the port is called the Widow Walk, giving the large number of supposed unexplained suicides and murders that have taken place in the region. In winter, sailors approaching the bay must also be aware of rivers, sea monsters that attack ships and careless sailors, dragging them into the depths. Despite these horrors, Perhaps the most dangerous threat to be found on Paul Alicine is the nefarious influence of the creature known as the living brain. This creature is a human brain that floats in a saline solution in a glass cylinder connected to a strange machinery. With a grey and overdeveloped frontal lobe, he possesses psionic powers and uses them to create a web of domination. In the remote past, this creature was Rudolf von Albecca, the spoiled son of the ruling family of La Mordia. After suffering a naval accident, his wounded and dying body was found at the rocky shores of Slosh Mordenheim and taken into the care of the distinguished physician Dr. Victor Mordenheim. The scientists dismissed the wounded body as impossible to save. But noticing that the brain was intact, he performed the surgical procedure to transplant it into a saline solution. Many experiments were carried out on the brain, which, despite being alive, did not seem to respond to other stimuli. Over time, however, he developed psionic powers, and using his mind-bending capabilities, caused one of Mordenheim's assistants to flee with him from the scientist's lab. Taking the complex machinery with him, assistant Alex Wilhaven took the living brain to poor Alicine, but the creature laid its plan for domination of the city with its mental powers. Hidden in a dockyard in the Quartier Marchand, he has numerous mind-dominated followers and runs a criminal network. Most of those who obey him do not know his true nature and believe that the brain is just the title of the organization's mysterious leader. Soon, the living brain discovered that its plans for domination were thwarted by another sinister influence over the city, and that several members of the city were already under the influence of another evil mastermind. Since then, Dominique Donaire and the Living Brain have been fighting a battle for the minds of Demolu, secretly fighting for control of the city. After exploring all mysteries unveiled by the detective Alanik Ray, we started to question what could have happened to the famous detective. Alanik Ray came from the upper classes of Neblus in Darkon but entered in conflict with his own father when he discovered that he was involved in a criminal scheme. His discoveries led to his father's imprisonment, but the elf was dishonored, and he began his career as a traveling detective. Throughout his career, Alanik Ray served in modern Shire for a time, where he met the doctor Arthur Sedwick who became his investigative partner. He became famous for his deduction capabilities and solved crimes, and was invited to assume the post of chief constabulary of the city of Martidia Bay in Darkon. After the disappearance of Azalin Rex, his investigations brought him into conflict with the Kargat, a powerful secret society run by undead. 
These confrontations eventually led them to abandon Martyria Bay, and they moved to Port Alicin, where he established his office together with Dr. Arthur Sedwick. The Alanic Ray's investigations led him to the living brain of Dominic Donaire. Had Dominic used his powers on him to order the investigation of his rival for the control of Port Alicin? Our ruminations come to an end when I hear a sound at the entrance of the attic. Alanic Ray was at the door, accompanied by a group of ruffians, and with a blank look in his eyes, he said that we should accompany them for a visit to the brain. A combat takes place in the abandoned attic, and we have trouble with this mind-controlled gang, but we defeat most of the attackers. As for Alanic Ray, we manage to take the detective down after a strong blow to the head, which knocks the elf out. Fearing that we had seriously injured him, we tired the unconscious detective and quickly left the docks, taking him to his office in the care of Dr. Arthur Sedwick. Arthur thanks us for rescuing his friend and tries to recover him from his injuries. The next day, when he awakens, we find that the blow to his mind has freed him from the mental domination of the living brain, and he also appears to be free from the compulsion to obey Dominic. Join us, subscribe to this channel, and activate notifications, and we will finally hear from Alanic Ray about his discoveries and revelations about the evil influence of Dominic Donaire the evil lord of Demolue.